Go ahead and get them started. Uh, thank you all again for being a part of these Q and A's. And these are opportunities for all of us to learn and develop and grow, brothers and sisters. So please understand, I'm not the master teacher. Uh, we're here to learn from each other, okay? And I want to make sure everybody understands that. Uh, we all want to search the scriptures to find out whatever we're discussing are in fact so from God's word. And so it's not true. Uh, because any of us say it or believe it, it's only true because we've discovered it in the Word of God rightly divided. I want you to always keep that, that mindset, regardless of who's teaching and who's preaching. Uh, the Word of God must always be your only and my only standard uh, of authority, okay? Uh, do want to just do a little house cleaning before we get started. We are recording these, so I'll let you know that. But I ask if you're not speaking, keep your mics muted. Uh, so that we don't get any feedback from the background, okay? And, uh, there will be an opportunity uh, for you to ask any questions you might have about the Word of God, okay? And make any comments. So I do want to let you all know that that will be available to you. But again, if you're not speaking so that we don't get feedback, uh, can you just look down and see if your mics are muted uh, so that we don't have any interruption during our study time uh, on tonight? And uh, we're going to go to God in prayer and, and then we'll be going from, uh, from that point. But now we just thank you, give you the praise, honor, and glory tonight. We thank you for all of these that have sold themselves uh, for this Zoom study, Lord. We just thank you. We know you know all things. We know that you're the head of all things. So we just give you all the glory and the honor tonight. We ask you as you as we come on this study that we open our minds and our hearts to your word. God, that we don't come with our own thoughts, our own opinions, and our own theories. But God, that we come with virgin eyes and virgin ears ready to and willing to hear what thus said uh, you and your word. Uh, we ask you to forgive us of all of our sins and our trespasses, what we thought it, what have we, we done it, or what have we heard it, uh, or what have we acted it out. We ask you, God, to cleanse us, wash us, God, as David asked you to do. And God, we ask you, God, that um, that uh, you will be with us in this study, that your presence will be here. And lead us, God, as a little part of our minds and our understanding, because you have commanded us to study, to show ourselves the proof of of the God, and not to be ashamed, rightly divide it the word of truth. Those that are coming in and those that had uh, had intentions of coming, we ask you to watch and look over them. We ask you that the gospel of God continue to be spread throughout this earth and land and country, that all men uh, may have the opportunity to obey the gospel and make heaven their home. We just thank you. We give you praise as we go forward now. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, Brother Joyce. Uh, Brother Stevenson had a lesson that he was going to do tonight and uh, um, I don't know. I know he was talking about Job chapter 28. Uh, I forgot the verse that, that he had gave, but I, he had a lesson prepared for tonight. So I don't know. I guess uh, there is anyone that has any questions until the brother's able to get, get back in with his lesson. Is there anybody that has any questions concerning the scriptures? Any questions? Hey, this is Joe. Can you hear me out? Yes, sir. I hear you loud and clear. All right. Hey, thank, thank you for inviting me. I, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, so I, my name is Joe. I, I go to church with Al, and I just started attending over where Al attends at, at uh, Central Pike Church of Christ. And so I, I have a question that I want to pitch out there that we was talking about Wednesday night at church and so I want to I want to ask this so <clears throat> uh, Jerry was preaching on Job uh, just just so happened this same probably the same thing Brother Stephen's going to talk about but uh, Jerry made mention and I, I'm not sure where this is at is, is that him trying to, is that him trying to come in yeah that's brother stevenson coming back in but you can go ahead with your question brother. All right, and so, so jerry, jerry made a comment and i don't know because i i wouldn't thought i was kind of a little so didn't know much about this but anyway he made a comment about nothing happens to us that god doesn't know about it or okays it to happen to us was he was he just I mean is is there any scripture to follow that up uh, brother Stevenson since tonight's your class did you hear the question he fell back out again well, um, but, pardon me his mic wasn't on so oh, he had to... okay. 
Okay, thank you, Sister Stevenson. Well, you know, we do know that God is omniscient, you know, which means he's all-knowing. And it is true, because even when you go back to Job chapter 1, which that's probably what uh, Jerry was alluding to uh, back back in Job chapter 1, and give me a second to find the scripture uh, in the days of peace of Job and sacrifice. Okay, now I'm going to start at verse number 6 where it says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, whence thou, uh, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fear of God and execute evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, uh, do Job fear God for naught? And then it goes on in verse number 10, it says, has, thou, uh, has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he have on every side? Uh, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. So I, I want to drop down. I want to drop down a little bit because I want to read through all of this. But uh, let me see. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has my power. Uh, excuse me, Jason, could you please mute your mic? Jason, could you? Brother Stevenson, could you, oh, he can't hear me yet. But could you mute that mic for Jason, Brother Stevenson? You're the host again. Thank you, my brother. But going back down to uh, verse number 12, is this talks about when uh, God had allowed Satan to, to do the things he did to Job, but you know, he told Satan that you can't kill him. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, Joe, God knows everything that goes on. There's nothing that he doesn't know because he is omniscient, he's all knowing. And things only happen if God allowed them to happen. So Satan or nobody else can do anything without God's permission or if he allowing it to happen. So when Jerry said that, when he made that comment that God knows everything that happens, yeah, he does. Maybe somebody else can answer that better. All right. Does well, that, that, did that help? I appreciate it. That makes, that makes a lot of sense, yeah, uh, about him giving permission for things to happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, we got to remember that he sits on the throne and he's in control. God is always in control. You know, we have people that may ask the question, well, why did God let that baby die? Because God knows something that we don't. You know, just like in Deuteronomy 29, 20, I say the secret of things belong to the Lord. We may not understand why it happens, but he does. And he knows why he allows things to happen. So, you know, there's, uh, I'm trying to, could you, anybody help me with this scripture? I'm trying to remember uh, where it talks about God knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. If anybody can help me with that, that scripture says something along those lines. Yeah, and that's that uh, Job 28, Job 28 and 24. And it reads for it. He looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the sun. I, I'm not sure that's the one you want, Brother Gray. Uh, Isaiah 46.10. Yes, that is the, that is the scripture Isaiah chapter forty six verse ten. Uh, brother of Jeff, I was uh, I was agreeing with you on that. That's the scripture uh, that that uh, says that. Yes. 
Word. thanking my brothers for that. Is there anybody else? Because we'll turn it back over to Brother Stevenson because he did have a lesson prepared. So is there anybody else that has any questions or comments before we get started? And, and Joe, uh, uh, I'm just I'm just saying thank you. Appreciate that. That helps a lot. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. And I just want to real quick for those who wasn't on to hear. Uh, this is Brother Joe. He worships with me at Central Pike Church of Christ. Um, and I, I invited him on and he reached out to me and got the information and he came on tonight to study with us. So just want to welcome the brother. And again, like I told you, Brother Joe, if there's anybody else that you know that's interested in studying the Bible, please pass on the information. I'm going to turn it back over to the hands of Brother Steves. Okay. Thank you, uh, Brother. And thank you for the question, the part that I did here, because that really, it falls in line with what we're going to want to look at uh, on tonight, among other questions. And that is, what does it mean that God is an all-seeing God? And I want to read Job 28 and 24. I'm going to read selected passage of Scripture, then I'll make a point, and then we'll be done for the night. Job chapter 28, Job says something in verse 24, for he, talking about God, he looketh to the end of the earth, and he seeth under the whole heaven. That is the God that we serve. He is an all-seeing God, and there is nothing that happens in his creation uh, that he is not privy to. The wise man Solomon in Proverbs chapter 15, and again, I'm going to go through these quickly, so jot them down, I'll get the recording. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 3, uh, Solomon writes, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Now get this, beholding the evil and the good. And so again, Solomon establishes that there is nothing that our God does not see. You go to the New Testament and you look at what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews uh, chapter 4. We look at verse number, verse number 13 of our Bibles. He says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, the Hebrew writer says, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so we serve a God, brothers and sisters, who have the ability to see, to see everything. Uh, there is nothing that uh, our all-seeing, all-knowing God does not know and that he does not hear. You know, but the question... Can't hear you, brother. Yeah, he froze up. He's frozen up, Sister uh, Stevenson. I don't know. Maybe it's his device or his internet. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, the devil's busy. But for the most part, what people will say is God sees our faith. Uh, he sees our needs. Uh, he sees our sins. Uh, he sees our good deeds. He sees our hearts. And all the those things are true. God does see that. And we have to understand that. He is an all-seeing God. But I want us to see also that God sees more than just those things as it relates, you know, to you and I as human beings, in particular as Christians. Go back to Genesis, if you'd be so kind, chapter 16. Remember Genesis 16, uh, Abraham and Sarah, God had made a promise to Abraham they were going to have a child. Uh, they were going to come from his bowels, from his loins. Uh, they got up in age, and so they can't talk to this plan, to talk to this plan plan they didn't wait on God and I think we know the story and so uh, Sarah told Abraham to take Hagar the midwife have a child from her and and, and they actually did that uh, he married Hagar Hagar ended up becoming pregnant and so you know once you get out in line with God and doing God's will and don't wait on his timing it just brings problems and I think I hope we understand that when you don't walk by faith and you don't wait on God's timing what will happen is you're going to cause chaos in your family and in your life. And that was the case with Abraham and Sarah. And so now Hagar is pregnant, and now Sarah is feeling like, uh, you know, she's being mocked by, by Hagar. But nonetheless, they, they put Hagar out of the house. And I want you to notice something. While she's pregnant, in verse 13, after they put her out of the house, the Bible says, and she called the name of the Lord that spake on her. Talk about, talk about Hagar. You, God, see as me. For she said, have I also here looking after him that seeth me? And so while Hagar was put out of the presence of Abram and Sarah in the wilderness while pregnant, the Lord spoke to her and, and had a conversation with Hagar, an Egyptian, uh, who, is, who is now pregnant with Abraham's child. And what she realizes is that God sees her pain. God sees where she is. God sees what she's dealing with. And so she calls the name of that place. When you look at it, she, she said, when she says this, thou God seest me, that's a name in the Hebrew, El Roi. When you look at that, El Roi, and that means the God that sees. 
God sees what you're dealing with. God sees what you're going through. God sees evil and good, as we read through the various scriptures on tonight. But also, brothers and sisters, God sees our potential. We always talk about he sees our heart, our sins. Uh, he knows our faults. He knows our good deeds. But God also sees the potential. And when you're a Christian, remember I'm talking to you, you need to start seeing yourselves with the potential that God sees in you. Go with me to the book of Judges, chapter 6. There's a man I want to look at, uh, and we'll talk about what it is that God sees. I want us to look at this man named Gideon tonight. In Joshua, in Judges, look at chapter 6 and verse 12. Uh, this is during the period of the Judges, Israel's history, the book of Judges. And I want you to look here at the call of Gideon uh, by God in the Judges, chapter 6 and verse number 12. Notice the response, the call of God to this man. In, in Judges chapter 6, and I want you to look with me in verse 12, the Bible says this, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, this is talking about Gideon, and said unto him, The Lord is with you. Now notice what he calls him, you mighty man of value. Now he addresses Gideon here as a mighty man of value. This is the first time God calls this man. Now when you talk about a mighty man of value, what God is saying when he calls Gideon, you're a man of strength. You're a man of power, you're a man of riches, you're a man of war. Now, what's important about this is Gideon has not fought one battle. Gideon has not fought one fight. Matter of fact, when God calls him in this verse, you have to understand Gideon actually is a coward. He is a coward. He has no courage. Well, why do you say that, Brother Season? Because when you go back to verse number 11, he's hiding because he's afraid of the Midianites. Look at verse 11 of Judges 6. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abba Ezra, right? as his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So he's hiding at this particular point from the enemy. Now you have to understand, the Midianites are God's enemy. God is calling uh, Gideon at a time, calling him a mighty man of value so that he would be the one to fight against God's enemies. He would be the one to lead. But before God called him, he is hiding. Notice it. He's hiding his work that he's doing because he's afraid of the Midianites. Okay? He's afraid of them. And so God's first assignment that he's going to give to Gideon when he calls him is to go out and I need you to destroy the idols. That's what he wants him to do first. I want you, John uh, Gideon, you're my man. I'm going to use you to destroy the enemies. But before you go destroy the enemies, you need to destroy the idols of the gods that's in your family. Drop down to verse 25 and verse 27. Now, Gideon is going to do that. Eventually, he's going to do it. But notice how he's going to do it because he's afraid. I want you to see the cowardice in, in Gideon's heart. When you drop down to verse number 25 of Judges chapter 6, the Bible says they came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take the young bulls, even the bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of death. Because this is what his parents were doing. They were false worshippers. So fall the hat, cut down the grove that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord your God upon the top of this rock in the place. And the second bullock, and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove. Thou shalt cut down. So God is telling him, get rid of the idols in your family. Now look at verse 27. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants, and he did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, now get this, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, and he could not do it by day, he did it by night. So here's the, an earth. Brother Stevenson's really having some issues. <laughs> he is really having some issues with his device. Maybe he'll sign back in on his phone. Because I noticed when he uses his phone, he don't have all these issues. I guess while we're waiting on the brother to come back in, is there anybody else that has any questions that they would like to go to the Bible with? Any questions? This is a good lesson to do. <laughs> Brother Green, the last uh, book, the last uh, verse that he used was on Judges 6 and and what? 
it was uh, to 25 through 27 that he was reading. He hadn't gotten to verse number, uh, well, he did read verse number 27, but he was going through uh, um, 25 through 27. And he was showing how um, Gideon was afraid is what he was uh, talking about in these scriptures that he was reading. Maybe you should try signing in on your phone, Brother Stevenson, if you're having problems with your laptop. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying. I didn't have that code. You just sent me a code. Yeah, I was going to try. Okay, let me try my bro. Okay, then. We'll wait on you because. Go ahead, my brother. Well, you were saying, Brother Henry uh, Green, that uh, Gideon's works are frail, what? Uh, he was talking about the fact that how Gideon was afraid, even though God had called him a man of valor. You know, which means, you know, bravery, uh, he was a man of war and so on and so forth. And Brother Stevenson was explaining, but he was saying that God called him a man of valor when actually he was afraid. And that's why he had went to these verses in Judges chapter six to show how he was afraid to do the things that God told him. Because when you go back to verse number 27, I'm gonna read the latter part. Well, I'm gonna read it. It says, then Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. So it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. I'm gonna turn it back over to Brother Stevenson. Go ahead, my brother. Okay, so thank you, Saints, and thank y'all for your patience. I really do appreciate that. And so, and so, what he he was, he was he was a coward, guys. Okay, I want you to see that. But although God called him a mighty man of value, but not only that, he was a pessimist. Go back to verse number twelve and look with me in verse number twelve and thirteen, because you'll notice here that Gideon thought that God had forsaken him. In verse number twelve of Judges chapter six, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of value. And Gideon, verse thirteen, and Gideon said unto him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befalling us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And so here you have Gideon, again, he's he's a very pessimistic individual as well. And so this is a man that, again, God has called a mighty man of value who had done no feats uh, even as we speak. Not only was he a, a, a coward, not only was he a pessimist when God calls him a mighty man of value, he was also a doubter in what God had said when God told him he was going to be with him. If you drop down to verse 16 of the same chapter, Judges chapter 6 and verse number 16. It says, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in your sight, then show me a sign that you talk with me. Depart not hence, I pray you, until I come unto you, and bring forth my presence, my present rather, and set it before you. And he said, I will tarry until you come again. And so here we have uh, Gideon. Notice this. He has, first of all, a poor self-image about himself. When you look back at verse number 15, he has a poor image about himself in verse 15. Oh, my Lord, where shall I save Israel? So he has a poor self-image, and then he's also doubting what God says. And so he's doubting what God has said, that he would be with him, and he would be the man that God chose to deliver uh, to deliver uh, Israel out of the hands of the Midianites. So he needed all these proofs. Now, here's the point. Here's the point I want to make. What God saw when he called him the mighty man of value, brothers and sisters, he saw the potential that, that Gideon had for obedience. He saw the potential in Gideon. See, one of the attributes of God is he's an all-knowing and an all-seeing God. And what God sees is he sees what you and I cannot see. He sees the potential in his creation. And that's how we have to look at ourselves. So you'll notice when, when he finally, and Gideon I'm talking about, when he finally have resolved in his mind that God is with him through all of the miracles, the fleece on the ground and the and the and the dew and the dew on the fleece and the dews on the ground the dew on the ground and not on the fleece, in Judges chapter seven, you'll see he finally goes to work. And once Gideon goes to work, here's what I like about Gideon. Once he is convinced in his mind through the miracles and the proofs that God gave him, he no longer doubts God. When God tells him with his 32,000 army 
Now, I need you to drop this down to 300. You don't find in Judges chapter 7 that Gideon is making any rebuttals against what God had commanded him to do. There's no complaining. There's no resistance. There's no second guessing in Gideon's heart once he's convinced about the God that he serves. So God tells him, I need you to, 32,000 is too many, 10,000 is too many. I need you to fight with 300 so that the people and you will know that I'm the one, God says, that gave the victory. And so Gideon doesn't complain. And so then, not only that, when he goes to war, God says, now I need you to go fight with a trumpet and some torches. Now think about that one. And he does that. He doesn't go get a sword. He doesn't tell God, God, we're going to need a sword to fight the battle. No, he goes to battle with a trumpet and some pictures. And so Gideon, when God calls him a man of value, when he calls him there, God is looking at, brothers and sisters, his potential. He was a man of humility. Remember after they won the battle? Look at this. And this is what I'm going to tell you. You've got to have humility, brothers and sisters. In Judges chapter 8, after he wins the battle, you know what can happen is, once people can see God is with you, uh, people then will try to make you king, you know, and make you ruler. But at the end of the day, a person who understands that the power and the strength and the ability that they have comes from God, they won't let man put them on a pedestal where they don't belong. And Judge, uh, in Judges chapter 8 and verse 22, this was Gideon's attitude because the people saw that God was definitely with him. And in Genesis, uh, Judges 8, 22, the Bible says, Then the Pedro said unto Gideon, you, you and your son and you have delivered from the hand of men. Gideon said unto him, Look at the humility rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. He says, The Lord shall rule over you. You see that heart, that spirit? See, this is what God saw in him before he ever fought one battle. Before he ever conquered any land. God said, you're a mighty man of value. Because what God sees, brothers and sisters, is potential. Go to Romans 4, 17. I'll wrap this up. Romans 4, 17. Well, we have to understand, I don't know who asked the question because the devil's busy on my end with extinction. Uh, but I don't know who asked the question about Satan and what Satan knows and, and yada yada, but I heard the, the, the answer that Brother Green gave, phenomenal answer, and a true answer of God's word, and that is, no one does nothing without God's knowledge and God's permission. We have to understand that. God is in control of everything, and that would include Satan, death, and hell. We have to understand that God is in control. And what our God does, he sees the beginning at the end and the end at the beginning. And he calls those things, not you and I, God calls those things, even though they're not, as though they are. In Romans 4, 17, listen what the Bible says here. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 17, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. This is what Paul is writing about, about Abraham. He said, before him whom he believed, even God, what does God do? He quickens the dead, and he calls those things which be not as though they were. And so when God called Gideon a mighty man of value, God sees the end at the beginning, and he can see the beginning at the end. Now, why do we talk about this? And this is to you and I who are Christians. I want you to look with me at one verse, and I mean it, I'll be done. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. I love the book of Ephesians, because this is the book we actually started studying at Goose Creek uh, last week. And it is a powerful letter that Paul writes to help us to see our identity in Christ. If you're a Christian, you have to understand, you and I have spiritual blessings that are in Christ that far outweigh anything we have or go through in this world. This is why our affections must be on things above and not on the things of this earth. And, and, and Ephesians chapter 2, one verse, listen to this verse, it's a very powerful verse when you and I understand the Holy Spirit's meaning behind letting Paul uh, say this to the saints in Ephesus. In Ephesians 2 and 10, Paul writes to Christians, for we, we who are Christians, we are his, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained, get this, that we should walk in them. So what Paul says as Christians, we are called his workmanship. Did y'all see that? We are his workmanship. Did you catch that verse? 
So what he's saying is God has already prepared a plan for our lives. What we must do like Gideon, we must walk by faith in that plan. Faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the word of God. God is working in us. He is working through us to make us what he has called us to be. And if we do what God has told us to do as Christians, if you're on here, you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we like Gideon would have fulfilled, brothers and sisters, the potential that God saw in us when he called us his workmanship. And so you have to see that God sees everything. That's my point I want to make. So I'm just thinking God just sees our sins, sees our heart, sees what's wrong. And those are things that we don't see. But he sees our potential as well. And all we have to do is walk in how God sees us. We need to see ourselves like God sees us. And we'll see how better our lives will be for that, okay? And so I hope there was something that was said that will help all of us, you know, to understand we serve an all-seeing and an all-knowing God, okay? At this time, I'll open it up for any questions or any comments that anybody like to make. Any questions or any comments that anybody like to make? Any questions? Yes, sir, Brother Joyce. Yes, God bless you, my brother. Uh, Thank I, you. Want, I want to... Uh, to kind of bring uh, bring a question uh, to all that are here, uh, especially with you, Brother Stevenson, uh, since we are honoring you as a teacher. Um, I, it's, it's been, I, I want to uh, see if you help us on a particular uh, <clears throat> subject of how our baptisms, uh, I was speaking of baptism from the denominational uh, world or baptism for from uh, religions that are not uh, pertaining to the doctrine of Christ, how those baptisms are not transferable. And the reason why I brought that up is because a lot of people uh, that we minister to, I'm sure a lot of us minister to people that are from denominational churches, they think that since they've been baptized in the denominational church, they can so-called, quote-unquote, transfer that when they come to a church of Christ or they come to a uh, uh, yes, the Church of Christ. So I want you to kind of, if you don't mind, my brother, elaborate just on that and how that uh, is true or not true. Yeah, a very great question. Let's turn to Second Corinthians chapter six, just real quickly. I'll try to be as quick as I can with this, brothers. So I want you to understand something that only God's people can do spiritual work. If we believe baptism is a spiritual work that came from God, and we believe a spiritual act takes place when you get baptized then a person who doesn't have God's spirit, those who aren't a part of God's temple cannot do God's work. You have to you have to understand that God is not with those people spiritually. He calls it the rain on the just and the unjust. But when it comes to spiritual work, God only has one place. This is exactly what Jesus is telling the woman in John 4. You don't work, you know not what you worship. Well, we know what we worship. This mountain is not the right mountain. That's what Jesus is telling her. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says it like this as he writes to the saints in Corinth. Verse 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He's talking spiritually here. For what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion have light with darkness? What concord have Christ with Belial? Or what part had he that believeth with an infidel? Now you have to understand, if you're not a Christian, you're an unbeliever. Being a Christian is more than just believing Jesus on a God believe he's the son of God. And they're not Christians. And being Christian is more than just, I believe the Bible, I don't believe in the devil, I don't worship the devil, okay? And so he says in verse 16, and what agreement to have the temple of God, get this, with idols? For you, talking about Christian, you are the temple of, of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. He's not talking about leave the world. He already talked about in 1 Corinthians 5. He's talking about leave the world, and we all got to get out of here. He's talking about come out come out from among them spiritually, the way you used to worship, the things you used to believe, the places you used to worship. Come out from among them and be you separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. And so the denominational world can do no spiritual work. The dead cannot bury the dead. When we're talking about baptism, 
People get baptized because they're spiritually dead. The dead cannot bury the dead. If I'm spiritually dead, how am I going to bury somebody else who's dead? The dead can't bury the dead. So it takes someone who is spiritually alive, who has God's spirit, to baptize someone who is spiritually dead. This is why you can't go to your denominational friends for baptism. You can't baptize yourself. It's ridiculous to think that it doesn't matter who baptizes you. If that's the case, I'm dead, but I can't ba baptize myself. It's impossible. What the example you see is always, get this, a male member of the church who has the spirit baptizing someone who is spiritually dead. Make sure you get that. I have a brother that lost their mind. I'm going to tell you, you've got some brothers lost their mind who believe that anybody can baptize you know, and especially they'll go to the world and let a, a dead male baptize them, dead spiritually. But I just question, what about, what about a, a, I'm going to tell you something we don't see. You don't see a spiritually alive woman baptizing anybody. Isn't that something? That in the Bible, and I know women got spirit, we got some faithful sisters in the church. Faithful, love God and God, God, and they have God's spirit. But isn't it funny that you don't see any of them baptized? None of them. And they're spiritually alive. And so you can't be baptized in water by somebody who's spiritually dead. The example we have is a male member to bring about a spiritual birth. The women bring about physical birth in the world, no matter how mad a man gets. God says, no, a woman is going to bring life into this world. They're going to bring physical birth. And God has said when it comes to spiritual birth, the man will be the one who leads that operation. And that's God's design. So I hope that helps. Any questions on that? Anybody have any questions? See, and I'll say this. Even in Acts 19, when you study that, you had some who had received a baptism that was legitimate. John's baptism. Now, notice that in Acts 19, that you had some people who had received a baptism that was a legitimate baptism, but it was now out of business because they couldn't give them the Spirit of God. Now, notice what they did in Acts 19. These people didn't know God been baptized before. That's not what they say. They don't say, I've already been baptized by John, and we know John's baptism came from heaven. Acts 19 and verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said unto him, We've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now notice the question that Paul asked them. When they, when they said they hadn't heard enough of the Holy Ghost after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he's going to ask them a question. He asked them, he said, unto what then were you, here's the key, baptized. That's what he asked them. Because you understand when you have the Holy Ghost under this dispensation, it's because you receive them at the point of baptism. It's the point where your sins are washed away and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul asked him about baptism. You ain't heard of the Holy Ghost? After the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, under what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. John's baptism could not give the Holy Spirit. John said, repent and be baptized, but he never said, he said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, but he never said, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. John never said that. He never said that. He just said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, Mark 1, 4. But John's baptism couldn't give the Spirit. So what are they going to do? Then said Paul, verse 4, John barely baptized to baptism of repentance, saying unto the people they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ. When they heard this, they said, I ain't getting dead water no more. I, I got baptized in the Baptist church. They never said it. I was under John's baptism. He never said that. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that was a baptism that was legitimate, but it's out of business. And so anybody who argued that, you know, I've been baptized in my denominational church, you just got wet is all you did. And that's all I did at one time. Because it has to be done by someone who's spiritually alive. Brother Green. Thank you, Brother Joyce. Yeah, I just want to uh, bag up what you were saying, Brother Stevenson, going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And he was talking about, you know, how they can't do spiritual work, how we as Christians can't do spiritual work with the denominational world. And when you read verse number one, going back to the second Corinthians chapter six and verse one, it says, we then as workers together with him, him who with Christ, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. 
So we see at the beginning of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, this is what he's talking about. Like you said, spiritual work. So how can, you know, we do spiritual work when you drop down to verse number 14 and following as you read, you know, this is talking about spiritual work. So, and also, you know, I just want to add to what Brother Joyce was asking, because, you know, we have this thing in the church where we have members of the church that has, for some strange reason, they want to make uh, um, Alexander Campbell uh, a brother in the church and, and and as we went through the history, there's been lessons on this. We don't see nowhere where he was baptized in a church. Now, we know for a fact that he was baptized by a Baptist elder. So how is it that he became a member of the church when that his history shows his baptism, but it doesn't show anything about him being baptized by a member of the Lord's church? So I, that just confuses me about that one. How is it this man a member of the church? Yeah, thank you, brother. And absolutely not impossible. Uh, any other question? Any other question? Uh, I see uh, Brother Henry, is that your hand? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I had uh, shared that question. I mean, my question comes out of uh, Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse 32, <clears throat> with regards to the unforgivable sin. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had to fix the two. All manner of sin shall be forgiven unto a man. That that uh, scripture. Yeah. Okay. So and he wants to explain. Well, what, what Jesus is saying in his earthly ministry is, you know, people are going to speak against Jesus, and Jesus is going to be rejected. But what he's saying is, if you reject the Holy Spirit and what the Spirit has said on the pages of inspiration. That is an unforgivable sin. There is no other sacrifice for sin. Brothers and sisters, if we reject the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus said he was going to send when he went to the Father, who speaks through the prophets, uh, who, who spoke through the men who wrote the Bible that we have, he's saying there is no forgiveness for that. He's not talking about just a one time I said something against the Holy Spirit or said something. I, I said I didn't believe the Bible was real at one point in time. What he's saying is if you utterly reject this as being the standard of authority, what's on these pages is written by the Spirit, then there is no forgiveness of sin. There's nothing else God is going to do. And so that's what Matthew 12, 32 is saying. Yeah, they, they rejected Jesus. They blasphemed against Jesus. But there is an opportunity still for them to be forgiven if they repent and listen to what the Spirit said they need to do in order to have forgiveness of their sins, okay? So I hope that helps. It's not just a one-time speak and you're done. Life is over. The idea is if you reject this message, there is no other message uh, when you reject the Spirit of grace, okay? And nothing left you but devil's hell. Any other questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? All right, saints and friends. Well, thank y'all for being a part of this study. Uh, please uh, just pray for pray for Xfinity here in Baytown. I don't know. Uh, it was a rough day, but we got through anyway. Yeah, well, praise God. We still glorify God. Okay, Sister Hernandez, I see your hand. Go ahead, my sister. Yes, I just don't understand how the brethren can say it about marriage and remarriage because you cannot remarry uh, because uh, with a verse there that uh, the only thing God cannot forgive, just like you explained, is unrepentant sin. And the blood of Christ can wash away any sin, any sin. You know, I, I, I really don't know how they can money over with a word when they suit them to, to fulfill their, their desire. You know, to fulfill, to... to back up what they are stating. Do you understand what I mean? You're talking about forgiveness, right? How they, yeah, how they, how come they can't see? Yeah, you can't worry about what they can't see, so, so you'll, I'm telling you, you'll lose a lot of sleep worrying about what somebody else can't see. Uh, I'm telling you, yeah, they ought to be able to see it, but remember, and I, I can say this till I die, brothers and sisters, all our job is to do is to plant and water. And I'm telling you, plant and water. Because there's some devils out there. God knows who the devils are. I mean, Jesus picked Judas. I mean, all you can do is plant and water. Some people are just created that God knows their heart just to be evil. That's what they are. And God will use their evil and my evilness, whoever it is, is evil. Uh, God will use that and he'll still get glory out of it. 
These brothers are blind because they think marriage is a spiritual. You know, when you get married, you don't become one soul. The Bible doesn't say that. Marriage is a is a earthly, it's a fleshly, it's the fleshly union. The two don't come one soul. That's why you didn't get out of this talking and this week on Tuesday study, I found my soulmate. You know, that, that kind of stuff. You got to watch where you're going with that kind of foolishness. You know, that's my soulmate. God, God put us together. You know, those kind of statements. Yeah, and then when divorce, when you, when y'all get upset, then, then what you say about God, did God mess up then? You know, I mean, just some of the stuff we just say is too denominationalism. You know, you made you made a choice, and you you pick the mate. God decides what marriage is, but marriage is just a fleshly union, which will be destroyed once you and I leave, or all that person dies. It's not you're not going to be looking for your wife or husband or your children when you die and leave this earth. So it's a union that's designed to glorify God in. It's it's a it's a good union. It's a union that's supposed to represent Christ in the church. But people die, and people get divorced. God divorced Israel. Because they acted up, and there's no scripture says you can't get remarried. Okay, and that's a whole other stuff. But yeah, don't don't worry about them not seeing my sister. Any other question? Any other question? Comments? Any other question? Comments or thoughts? Any questions? Any Bible question? All right, I'll take it as that would be no. Well, thank y'all for being a part of these studies. Really do mean that. Uh, remember, our next study, be God's will, will be on Brother Green's Zoom page on um, Monday. Six, seven o'clock, and we are in Matthew chapter 12. It's been a great study. You've been missing Mark's studies, Mark 12, forgive me. If you've been missing our studies on Mark, you've been missing out on a lot of good studies, okay? Uh, I see Brother Williams. I see your hand. And then Brother Green. Brother Walter Williams. Okay, uh, Brother Green. Yeah, I just want to ask you real quick, my brother. I meant to ask you at the beginning, but you was having the technical difficulties. I would like to ask you if you'll go ahead and uh, teach Mark chapter 12 on Monday. Okay, sure will, my brother. I sure will. God save the second. I'll teach it on Monday, okay? Anybody else? Anybody have anything else? Can All I right. say something? Can I say, sorry, brother? What is her name? Yes, ma'am. Yes, that we have uh, some... I have to go to church every day. That's why sometimes I, uh, the last couple of days, I haven't come online. You know, then if you don't see me, because I in the building with, you know, doing some work with the children and so on. But I'm okay, right here. God bless you, my sister. Right <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, God bless you. We'll keep you in our prayers. Okay. Sure will, Sister Nandis. Are, are there any other prayer requests before we close out? Please keep me, uh, my family prayer. Uh, we lost, had a loss in the family, the Felder family, if you would, keep them in your thoughts and prayers. And many of you know the Williams family. Uh, we lost little Mikhail. I mean, you've been praying for him, and uh, he passed away on last week, and we'll be uh, having a memorial service for him, be gone well next Saturday. So please keep uh, Mike and Lydia Williams, if you could, in your thoughts and your prayers, okay? And my Aunt Peggy Stevenson's in the hospital, so keep her in your prayers. What about the Green? Yes, I just want to ask you all to keep me and my wife in prayer. Um, that we can withstand the darts of the devil and just uh, stay strong together. Amen. God bless you. We sure will, because the devil is busy, brothers and sisters, but he's a liar and the truth ain't in him. Anybody else? Okay, my God, let's pray. Our God, 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 Sorry, sorry. Okay, sure will, Sister Nan. That's okay. That's okay. It's still, still, sure will, uh, Sister Nan. With the work, with the work, it's still looking, you know, with the job. Yeah, look. Okay. Okay, my sister, we sure will. Let's pray. Our God, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much again for this time you allowed us to spend and open up your divine word, which we believe, Father, will lead us from earth to glory if we apply to our lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for this roadmap for our soul, giving us an opportunity to examine ourselves, uh, whether we be in the faith. Uh, Father, I pray we don't take opportunities like this for granted. I pray that we don't just be hearers of your word, but Father, we'll be doers. And Father, will work out our soul's salvation and we'll do it with fear and trembling. Father, for every Christian on the Zoom call who heard the gospel, believed and repented, confessed your son as Lord and been baptized into Christ. Father, obey that plan of salvation. I pray to Father that we will see in our lives what you see in our lives. We're your workmanship. And Father, we are seated in heavenly places. And greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. I pray we'll walk by faith and not by sight. And Father, just trust you, Father, not lean on our own understanding. Help us not be offended, dear God, in standing boldly when opportunities open up where we can share the gospel message to a lost and dying world. Many of us are among people who think they're saved, 
Many of us live among people who have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. I pray to Father that we'll have courage to stand up and Father to share your word with meekness, but also with boldness. Father, Father God, understanding that God, you are with us and we're never alone. Father, you've heard the various requests, my family and others. To God, I pray you will strengthen us. Hold us up on every leaning side, those who are bereaved. For our sister Hernandez, Father, her daughter, who has stood boldly, Father, on her convictions of not working on Sunday. Father God, I pray you look down on her and bless her, dear God. Pray to Father, you will find someone out there, Father, who will look at her resume. And Father, find favor with her. As many of your great men and women, Father, often found favor in a worldly kingdom like Joseph and Daniel. Father, you did it then and we believe you can do it now. You can do exceedingly abundantly above what we ask or think because we're your children. And Father God, we are the apple of your eye. Thank you for Sister Hernandez, a great mother, Father, who's concerned about her daughter's physical and spiritual well-being. And pray, Father, we you will bless that family. Now, Father, if we go our separate ways, we ask, Father, that you allow your angels to watch over us. Give us a good night, rest, or sleep. And we understand those who are Christians that tomorrow's the first day of the week. Pray we'll rise, Father, with good health, right mind. Get ourselves dressed, with most of our hearts dressed, to gather together with the saints, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Forgive us of any sins as you see the godly sorrow and continue to defeat us when we do things, say things, think things that are contrary to your will is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you, saints, the love of God. Y'all stay strong and y'all have a good night, okay? Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.